even a smaller number of sats will be a significant fortune because money will be more sound. 0.1 Bitcoin will be 5 million US dollars in today's purchasing powers terms. If you measure it in Satoshis and Bitcoins, then you just see a number going up every two weeks when you get paid and you honestly feel much more zen. Bitcoin makes you more frugal. It will make everybody and will make the world better on individual level, on family level, and also for our countries. A few years ago, it was, oh, come to 6.125 Bitcoin. Then a few years back, it was like, oh, come to one Bitcoin. Now, if the new goal get to 0.1 Bitcoin. Bitcoin as a monetary asset is far superior to me than gold. My life is getting better when I'm on a Bitcoin standard. Bitcoin reduces my jealousy, reduces my anxiety, makes me realize that anything good that happens in the world, in a new invention in India, in China, in Africa, anywhere, in Europe, anywhere, it's going to benefit me. Larry Fink works for me. Everybody in Bitcoin works for me. It's a great honor to have you. Uh, and uh, you have something interesting. You have background in psychology and math, as, as I understand it. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. I have a PhD in educational methods, quantitative methods in educational psychology. So I'm a math educator. I studied psychology. And I think a lot of ways it maybe led me to be curious about Bitcoin years ago. How has this, um, and then I really want to get into math and psychology a little bit later and how this relates to Bitcoin, um, also with your, with your background, but in general, how does this background with uh, math, math and with uh, psychology has shaped your view uh, on Bitcoin? Yeah, it, it made me curious about Bitcoin because math has rules. Zero cannot equal one. You cannot divide by zero. The conservation of energy, the conversation, conservation of, of mass, uh, this, all these rules, you, you, it makes you think in a system, almost like an engineer. And so, so when somebody explains Bitcoin to you, you, you're originally very skeptic. And so, but you're very curious about it. You're even curious about, you know, what is the entropy in 24 words or 12 words? You're very curious about these little things. Before you adopt Bitcoin as a, as a math person, as a psychology person, you really um, have a lot of obstacles, maybe, that you put for yourself. You almost have to convince yourself that, okay, it's safe and secure. Okay, it is centralized. It is peer-to-peer -peer and, and so on. And then, and then from a psychology point of view, Robin, I find... Something is always stopping you. Is it the psychology? Is it the ego? Is it the fear of loss? And then even when you get into Bitcoin, are you going in there with a fiat mentality to make money almost like a, like a, like a tech stock? Are you, are you in it to erase a previous loss from your, from your past history, from your life, even from your ancestors? So it's, it's, um, it all ties in, but it definitely gives you a framework. Math gives you framework rules that, that immediately, if, if you see violations of axioms and rules, you, you immediately start seeing, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a weakness in fiat. That's a thread that you can pull and then, or a, or a card that you could pull and a house of cards falls down. It's so interesting because I so often ask the question of like how, how Bitcoin will uh, change society. And I think you, as someone who has experience with psychology, with our brain and how we are wired, um, I think the answer could be really interesting. How do you think does money influence our brain? Or I differently ask, what will change in society if we have sound money versus if we have, as right now, feared money as the dominant resource? Like I'm really talking of like, what will change to our brains, our psychology when we have sound money completely in our whole planet? There's no central banks. There's no money printing sound money. Let's say Bitcoin is the foundation to everything. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I mean, if we had that, I think a lot of people's behaviors will change. Somebody may not want to spend their last dollar on a, on, on a, on a sin on a, or, a, or, a, or a vice, maybe a cigarette or something, something that's, that's more right now. So time preference, as Seyfuddin Amus explains the concept, time preference, time, com time preference um, will become lower. That's very important. There's a lot of nihilism, a lot of 
feeling that a lot, I see it with younger generations um, that they cannot buy a house, they cannot save, their wealth is melting. Uh, the, and, and, and that really um, changes when you have sound money, because even if you have a single dollar, you can invest it in an asset like Bitcoin, but you couldn't do the same with investing it in real estate, for example. There are thresholds that you cannot make. And then, uh, you know, Robin, I mean, I, I was born in a different part of the world. I, I came to the U.S. I'm very grateful. But I got to see how even in how populations migrate from, I, I don't know if, that, if that's a good term, from the third world to the second world to the first world. A lot of that was forced because people cannot save where they are and they're seeking another um, another place. So, you know, you see it very common, like uh, a, a professional would move from their home, go to the Gulf area and work for a few years and then try either to save money and go back home or then save money and try to go to the West, Australia, North America, Europe. And I, I'm not saying that that's, that's harmful. I'm, I'm saying that in a Bitcoin standard, everybody will have opportunity where they are. And, it would, and they would not be forced to, to, to always have to move to the West. And I think, I think it will make everybody and will make the world better all on individual level, on family level, and also for our countries, it will be more stable. It's interesting because you uh, originally come from Iraq, uh, if, if, uh, if I remember that correctly, and now you are, I think, in the USA. So, so like you migrated from, from Iraq there. So, so on the one hand, like you have uh, a lot of experiences with like different cultures because like Iraq and then, then USA, like those are already two very different uh, cultures and, and living experiences. Um, what did you learn there for uh, for life and also maybe what, what Bitcoin related is with, with countries and what money they use? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So in, in much of the world, in, in that part of the world, I'm very lucky I was born in Iraq. I, I grew up in Kuwait and my family, we know we came to the US and I'm very grateful because that upbringing, I got to see another part of the world where, um, you know, gold is money. Like it's, it, there's a higher emphasis on gold. I know if you have, I have friends from India and they say it's the same thing. Gold is money. Everything else is paper. And then I grew up in a world where the US dollar was considered sound money relatively, of course, to the fiat currencies of the time. But I also got to see it in my own lifetime. I mean, not many people can say that they got to see it in their own lifetime. You know, we read in the history books about Zimbabwe and, and Weimar Republic, but I got to see it even in Iraq, for example, in the 70s, very strong currency. Roughly the, roughly the Iraqi dinar was like three US dollars, almost like a pegged. Um, and, and very similar to the Kuwaiti dinar now, which is the strongest currency in the world in terms of uh, how many dollars it is for one Kuwaiti dinar. But I guess I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is I got to see it in my own lifetime, Robin, because I'm 54, where the, where the Iraqi dinar went from being hard money, uh, you know, in the 70s with the oil revenues. And then slowly the government started printing it on thinner paper on Xerox paper to fund the, the, the war in the 80s. And I started seeing how slowly people started to, to behave. And I see it even now, I, I, mean, I think back and I see how my parents and my family were behaving and how gold became more money. People started realizing this. I started, I remember even that at some point there was the, the Iraqi government said, we need money from the people's people's houses from people's possessions we needed to donate to the war effort and it was a big propaganda big thing and 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 they, they would show like women would walk and take off their gold necklace and 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 donate it to the war effort so i i got to see that and it made sense to me um later how the basement of currency is really harmful it it hurts everything that memory i thought i forgot it and then with bitcoin all these memories came back what were some of the effects that you have seen? Like you lived through that inflation in Iraq uh, with, with your family, uh, with your friends. You probably have a lot of uh, stories around that where you all of a sudden look back and like, oh, yeah, like uh, inflation was that bad. Uh, can you share some of those? 
Yeah, I mean, it really is the same any part of the world that has gone through this. You could speak to somebody from Venezuela or Argentina, and it just shows you as humans, we're all the same, same blood, same experience. You know, for example, Robin, like you see a line and you you stand in line because you don't know what they're selling, but maybe it's it's something that is uh, that must be worth it, that people are standing in line. And there's also always the dual standard. So there will be one rate for the government that is the official rate. And then there will be the, the rate on the so-called, you know, under the table or the black market. So you start seeing how everything gets distorted and, and it really magnifies the, uh, the, the cantillon effect, like who's closer to the money printer. You start seeing it uh, firsthand. And, and, and you think it will never happen in the West. But honestly, I mean, like I said, we are all humans, same blood, same genetics, same um, uh, experiences, same psychology. It could happen anywhere. I mean, we kind of already see the, the beginnings of that. Uh, with uh, I think the, the most of the money printing was in the 2020 era. And the more you print, the more you have to print to make up for the printing. And then you have to print more to make up for the other printing. So uh, I feel like we... We will come there. It's just a question of, of time. So it's so interesting to hear those stories. Uh, I just released, I think today or yesterday, a, a podcast with Ariel from uh, Argentina. And he talked about the history of the last like 50 years in Argentina uh, of, of the money printing and how often they exchanged the currency. There was like currencies only there for two years, then they hype inflated and they made up a new fiat currency. Then this one lasted four years, then the next one lasted three years. So like, uh, it's, it's really interesting and sad to see those fiat currency experiments played with people's life. Like the, there are financial energies uh, in there. So uh, that, that's how I feel like why Bitcoin is so, so important. But I have another question. Um, back to your psychology background for Bitcoin, because we always have um, this this thing like, oh, Bitcoin fixes that, Bitcoin uh, does that for humanity. Um, from a human standpoint, what human problems does Bitcoin not solve? Like, uh, uh, is it solving war? Is it not solving war? Is what human problems that do we have now that maybe the Bitcoin community is like, oh, yeah, Bitcoin fixes it. But you think like um, uh, Bitcoin will not uh, solve those kind of problems? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a very interesting point. So so, I mean, Bitcoin will not fix the, for example, jealousy. Like if I am jealous of you and I probably should be jealous of you, but but Bitcoin, Bitcoin fixes Bitcoin fixes so many problems and it minimizes the the. Um, the, the effects, the bad um, feelings that somebody could have. So Bitcoin will not fix jealousy. Bitcoin will reduce violence, but will not eliminate violence. Bitcoin will reduce distortion, but it will take time until it fully gets established and adopted. Well, that will happen. So Bitcoin will not fix entirely human nature. There will still be accidents. There will still be acts based on jealousy and, and, and sin. But, but in many sense, Bitcoin will make the higher reward on cooperation, on cooperation. And that's very, very important because this Bitcoin is the only asset that, you know, like it's a bare asset, but I can, I cannot, you cannot take it from me. I can decide to, to, to die and not have it go to you. So, so the, it's a different kind of asset. I don't think humanity ever had an asset like that because gold was physical and you could take it kill me and take it from me so bitcoin is something very new it will not fix everything but it will go a long 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 way so that's why it's probably really hard to say how how bitcoin will change uh, humans as it's uh, such a unique new thing right yeah, like, you know, I, I mean, I, in psychology, there's I, one of my favorite um, psychologists, he, he was born in the, like, the German Empire, became a, became a U.S. citizen, like uh, Eric Erickson, Eric Erickson, and he has a theory of the eight stages of human development. And so, and it's really a beautiful theory, and it's different phases in everybody's life of what they are going through, from a toddler all the way to old age. And so when you see somebody, they're, they're at that stage and they're looking for for example they're in the 20s their biggest concern is intimacy finding a partner you look at somebody my age in my 50s and it's more about 
generativity versus stagnation. You look at somebody in their 80s and it's all about, you know, did I live a wholesome life or did I regret something? So even when a two-year-old, you know, it's about independence versus... So all these stages, everybody will be at that stage. And sometimes they have so much on their plate that they cannot think about Bitcoin. They cannot make enough time to study Bitcoin or they maybe encounter Bitcoin, but their ego is in the way. They are not... Or like Michael Saylor says, they don't need to know. So a lot of times people are in a well and in a, in a good fiat position financially, so they do not need to know Bitcoin. But but at some point, like Michael Saylor says, you know, with with his company, they got to a point where they have to know, otherwise they would face a slow death, as Michael Saylor explains. And I think you had him, and you did a. I mean, your uh, podcast with him was amazing. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, like the, the, the one was really good. Uh, it will take me a long time till uh, another video will come to, to that area of views and stuff like that. I think the, 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 the Michael Saylor interview, interview was, a, was a really interesting one because I have never heard him talking uh, talk about uh, scaling Bitcoin so much. So like that's an interesting one. Um, maybe on, on that note, did... Bitcoin also changed your view on retirement and, and saving money that you had before Bitcoin, a, a different view on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was, I was always a saver. And so I always thought that I needed to have somebody to manage my money. I needed to have somebody tell me what to buy and what to sell. I needed to, uh, and that's why um, I needed to have an active brokerage account and I needed to pay somebody 2%. They pay, they charge 2% to, uh, to manage the money. And then, and then I, um, I, I, the more with, the more I learned about Bitcoin, the real, the more I realized that a lot of these jobs are really because of our broken fiat money and that I can look back and say, maybe this person is not adding value to, to me. I can just, in the old days, I can just buy gold and stash under the mattress, but now it's even better. I can buy Bitcoin and take it into self-custody in, in a, in a multi-sig cold wallet. And so, so that changed a lot for me, Bitcoin, on how I view so many jobs and so many positions and so many industries, Robin, that are just almost like zombie industries. They don't exist. They don't really add value, but they, their only advantage is they're close to the money printer and therefore they are making this inefficient system. And once a, a system that's more efficient, 10x more efficient like Bitcoin, a lot of these people will have to find new ways to add value. Yeah, I, I love that a lot. And it also changes a lot when you... I. I I personally try to start counting in Bitcoin now when I think of like my net worth and I stopped counting in US dollars because US dollars are like, oh yeah, it's, it's going up, it's going down, it's volatile. And you feel really clever if like the Bitcoin price is up uh, in US dollar terms and your net worth goes up, but it's not reality. But Bitcoin is reality. And if I uh, count my wealth in, in Bitcoin, it's it's way uh, calmer. Like you you count like oh like there is uh, that many Bitcoin more coming, that many Bitcoin more coming. Like you you have a calmer, more steady way of of uh, getting uh, more more of, of of your net worth. So I feel like if you start actually um, accounting your like if you have Bitcoin as your store of value as your main store of value, then you should also switch to like counting that as your unit of account in for your long-term plans obviously it's really hard when you go to the supermarket and think in satoshis uh, because you have to calculate a lot so i don't do that but when it comes to like net worth like why not count in bitcoin why not count in satoshis so that's that's something that i i try to do and it's uh, something that calms you down uh, and it's like oh yo it's it's not that bad if like bitcoin dips or bitcoin in prices up like who, who cares? Like my Bitcoin is still my Bitcoin and I know the value of what, what it will be in five, 10, 20 years. So like that, that's one thing that I, I, I really got from, from Bitcoin and it's, it's really calm. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Like when I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, you should never say how much Bitcoin you have or anyone or, the, the, and, and whatever you have, 
to, to compare is to despair. So just compare yourself to yourself and how much you had before. And so I just try to add value every month. I want to put more, give more value to society through my job and my earnings. And so that I have more Satoshis at the end. But like I, 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 like I'm, I want to become, for example, a Satoshi billionaire. And, you know, if you do the math, a Satoshi billionaire, that's a number, you know, 10 bitcoins, for example. But that's, that's a great goal. Or you can have a goal of becoming a whole coiner. That's a great goal. And even much less than that, that is still a fine goal. And to add to what you were saying, Robin, I mean, you know, you have, it's good to have multiple stacks, multiple bags, so to speak. And so, for example, if I have a stack that I, I'm stored in retirement for long term or for my, to give to my daughter or and, and, and my after my life, then I don't care about that. It's a number of Bitcoins and that's, that, that's gone. I don't need to check how much it is in fiat. It's just in my mind, it's a number. And then, and then the stash that I'm DCAing, you know, adding every paycheck to, well, I don't care if, like you said, if you measure it in, in, in Satoshis and Bitcoins, then you just see a number going up every two weeks when you get paid. And, and, and you feel, you honestly feel much more Zen. And this was something that I noticed with a lot of Bitcoiners, the older, the longer they have, and they are in Bitcoin, the more zen that they are honestly i mean um, a lot of guests that you have and because like i think it has to do with what you were saying they measure their wealth in bitcoin and they think long term yeah and i think uh, the point that you brought up in the beginning is is an amazing one because you you should have the the highest possible goal uh, uh in 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 bitcoin terms uh, but remembering that even a small amount of bitcoin will be a significant amount of 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 wealth long term uh so if we come back to like okay how many bitcoin should you accumulate a question that uh, is actually asked a lot in the bitcoin community there is like always this goal post moving like a few years ago it was like oh come to 6.125 bitcoin then a few years back it was like oh come to one bitcoin now i feel like the the new goal post is like get to 0.1 bitcoin uh because that will be a significantly amount of of wealth uh they're even furious of like retiring uh, uh, on 0.1 bitcoin uh on uh when when you are like in in 10 years time or 15 years time depending on on your expenses and where you live and and if you have to feed a family of course there are a lot of factors involved in that but it's the significance of of just a small amount of bitcoin in a hyper inflated fiat currency world i think a lot of people don't really uh um give this em uh, enough credit yeah no i agree robin and also i mean, i think bitcoin makes you more frugal you know a while back there was the whole minimalist movement of how become uh, you become happier when you are more of a minimalist and there is there was some virtue there but 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 bitcoin really gives you why um why you when you become frugal and you save things in bitcoin and you you really ask yourself before you buy anything do i really need this and is this really valuable and so and i, I joke that when i see things I don't need. I just see them as less Bitcoin. I see, oh, all oh, this is a, this is a new motorcycle, whatever. This is a new car. Oh, that's just less Bitcoin. You know, if it's not going to add value or change my life or help my family, and and I, I'd rather get more Bitcoin. And so it really does help. And you realize that there's so much stuff that you have that you really don't need. And you're buying plastic, and you're getting it shipped from, you know, all over the world, China or wherever. And it's you you are you you do live a better lighter life more minimalist but happier with bitcoin more experiences what would you say is the most uh fascinating thing that you discovered within bitcoin so i have to admit that when i grew up i grew up in a in a in a conservative muslim country and i learned and 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 i mean being christian i like we still learned we studied all the religions judaism we we studied all the religions and the one thing that i never understood until i learned about bitcoin robin is i always under i always i was i was always told that compound interest or usury is a sin it's one of the cardinal sins in islam it's a it's a huge sin it's more than eating pork or drinking alcohol or committing adultery or, but like, but I never, but, but then when I, oh, you know, I learned mathematics, I study, and it's also in the Bible and the same thing and changing of weights and measures and cheating with weights and measures and, and the story of Jesus Christ 
going with the whip and breaking the the money changers table in the father's temple. I mean, I, that was always something we studied. And even in Judaism, that you you do not charge usury to your family members. So I, that was in the back of my mind. But I always thought it was backwards. I thought, oh, my goodness, like this is these religions, they don't know what they're talking about because it's just math and compound interest. And But honestly, I was humbled to realize that there is ancient wisdom in, in what these ancient religions are were trying to tell us. And that if and that and that a lot of what we see today is 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 a result of broken money, of fiat money, where money has to debase, the currency has to debase, and you have to charge interest. And 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 that is not necessarily uh natural in in hard money i mean it feels natural because we've been living in it for maybe i mean people say 1971 i argue that it's probably even before that maybe and you know in the united states we can argue it goes back to 1913 so so that was one of the biggest things about bitcoin i know I, it's not a con- con- controversial subject really i just think that there is more wisdom even if you're not religious there is more beautiful wisdom in the old you know, Abrahamic religions about money and about why usury is not good and and that we should be humble to listen to it, even if we are secular people. It's so, it's so interesting, the connection to religion. Um, we even made like some some episodes around that with, with Pastor Coin and, and it's really interesting to go through. Um, one thing that I really also want to get into this episode, as you have also math background, uh, and I think, I don't know, I think we discussed it really briefly uh, on, on a Satoshi hangout uh, that we were on, um, the Bitcoin power law. Uh, you you have like a math background. I don't know if you saw the episodes where, where I discussed with, with different people the, the power law. Um, what, what's your take on uh, on the Bitcoin power law and, and do you see it as, uh, as, a, as a good form of predicting the growth of Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a really good question. I spent a lot of time thinking about it and, and listening to people. And so the the idea there is that, is it valid? So the question is, is the power law valid? Well, in psychology, in, in measurement and evaluation, the, the concept of validity, what is valid? Like, is a test valid? Is a measurement valid? Is a scale valid? Technically, there are six or seven types of validity. So if you Google, for example, types of validity, psychology, if you Google, you will see a list of six or seven of them, like, you know, content validity, face validity, predictive validity, um, convergent validity, discriminant validity. And all these are concepts that you can say one by one, does it have this type of validity or not? So I so technically, when you look at the formula, the power law, I argue that, yes, it has a little bit of every one of these types of validity. However, there's a however. However, there are two things. One thing is it technically when in in psychology, it's not whether the test itself is valid or not valid. The judgment is about every person's interpretation of the test. Is that valid or is not valid? So it's not the test that we argue or worry about. Is it valid or not valid? Because it has all these types of validity on face on content, on predictive, on convergent, on discriminant. We worry about, is my is every different interpretation valid or not valid? So I'll give you an example. I can come to the power law and say, you know, Robin, based on my interpretation of the power law, I'm going to buy and hold and never trade. That's my interpretation. Somebody else might come and say, you know, based on my their interpretation, they're going to time the market and 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 sell at the high and buy it back at the low and so on. So technically, it's my, we can argue whether my interpretation is valid or not for me. We can argue whether their interpretation is valid or not for them. But the test itself, it has the basic six or seven, enough of the six or seven validities. But we worry more about every person's interpretation because maybe my interpretation will be not good for me. Maybe my interpretation would be, you know, lacking for other somebody else. So it's a very fluid subject. I know, I, I feel like I'm dancing, I know, like, or, or, or wimping out of the question or like, you know, like a politician, but really this is, this is truly the way of how we think about it in terms of psychology and measurement and evaluation. 
The last, the last point I just say is also the word sometimes gives people a, a hang up, like the, whether you call it a law or a formula or an equation or a regression. I mean, sometimes the people see the word law and they think it's that it's deterministic, but they don't realize that there's so much more, even in a model, there's so much room for noise and and randomness. And so, and you know, honestly, Robin, like I'm the first to tell you, I mean, math humbles you and making a prediction humbles you because you you will realize there's so much that we cannot account for. We cannot account for a nation adopting a strategic reserve. We cannot account for a big company making it a treasury asset. We cannot account for um, things that are that will like 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 uh, Michael Saylor would say Godzilla enters into the playground. I don't did I answer it? I feel like I danced a lot and then I just it's not easy to answer. I think uh it's 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 one of the best explanations that I heard around if the bitcoin power law is valid. I, I love that explanation and it's interesting when I think about it because as you said that's the only problem that I have with the bitcoin power law. Um But when we take it as something to uh, model uh, a growth plan of the of the past uh, on on Bitcoin and maybe having a normal base case of projection in the future, maybe not against the dollar but even against uh, gold, that's the most interesting for me. Because against the dollar, I feel like dollar can hyperinflate uh, this year can help inflate next year if there's something weird happening. So I don't know if we should ever use such a model uh, to begin with, where the dollar is the underlying asset. So that's why I like um, when Stephen was on my show uh, and he showed me the power law of Bitcoin, where we don't uh, do it against the dollar, but against gold, something way more interesting because then you can maybe actually account for those Godzilla moments where maybe a hyperinflation happens in the USA, but in the hyperinflation, also gold will rise a lot, but Bitcoin will rise faster and the adoption of Bitcoin will rise faster. So I feel like that's my most favorite Bitcoin power law. But even if we take the gold one, there's still the case of Uh, maybe central banks discover tomorrow, oh, like, oh, gold is, is not there. Like gold is not as popular anymore and young people don't care about gold. And, oh, we, we, we maybe should buy Bitcoin now. Uh, and maybe um, central banks start slowly selling gold and slowly buying Bitcoin. What will that do to that graph if, if uh, the, the Federal Reserve, for example, decides to do that? So it doesn't account for those crazy outbreaks that are maybe not realistic, but possible. So that, that that's my only problem. If you try to sell a power law as if it's like, oh, take this. And with that, you can uh, uh, trade your Bitcoin or you have a weighted DCA plan or something like that. No, just like DCA what you feel comfortable in because you don't know what happens. If you take because of the Bitcoin power law, the Bitcoin power law says like, oh, we are now in a, in a, a little bit of a bubble area, trade some Bitcoin off, uh, get in some cash. What if that is the point of hyperinflation? What if that is the point where Bitcoin goes parabolic up and you will never be able to buy back those Bitcoin in your life? Like that's why I'm skeptical But I love that we put math uh, in into this question of um, how Bitcoin will grow. And I also saw that um, the Michael Saylor's model of predicting the Bitcoin price is actually quite similar than the Bitcoin power law. I saw that the, the base case of Michael Saylor, not the bull case or not the bear case, but the base case of, I think, 30 million US dollars in 2045. Five, uh, it was um, is quite uh, similar to the Bitcoin power law. Uh, um, so it's it's interesting for me that like there there are different people coming with different models to a similar conclusion, um, and uh, they they kind of come there. The, the only thing is it's like I have a hard time thinking of inflation being so low. 
I have a hard time thinking that till 2049, we will not, we, we will still have a US dollar that is accurately uh, displaying today's wealth. So I, I don't know what, if, if Bitcoin is 13 million US dollars in, in 2045, probably uh, the US dollar is really strong. Otherwise, Bitcoin is probably way higher than that because inflation will be will be massive. So it's it, it's an interesting topic. I also dance around that, that topic a little bit uh, because I, I, I cannot really say it's not valid. I, I don't like it. I hate it or something like that. But I also am really cautious about the possible outcomes, especially with new people that hear uh, a nice story and there are some uh, really intelligent people behind that and then saying, oh, it's very valid and it's very good to Paolo. And then they maybe make the mistake on trading on it and then they get wrecked. So th like, that's what I really try to always bring up and say like, oh, be cautious. Like, <laughs> don't sell yeah. your Bitcoin. It's not a good a choice. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And and honestly, Robin, like even in math, and we tell ourselves always, it's it, sometimes it's more important to be directionally correct. Sometimes it's even enough to be directionally correct than it is to be exact. You know, you don't have to necessarily hit the bullseye, but if you're hitting in the direction target of the direction of the target, you are good enough compared to what else you could be doing. You could be shorting it. You could be not buying it at all and not getting involved, you know, boycotting yourself from Bitcoin. So that, so just to be directionally correct, I think that would be very, very rewarding. Uh, that's, that's definitely something I find. Um, and you don't, and we can maybe intellectually try to practice math and models. I like the stock to flow model conceptually. I think that's, that's beautiful as well, even though, but but like you said, you it's ev like and like I was telling you, it's not the model itself because that also has enough of the validi the, the, the six or seven validity concepts or attributes. It's really every personal's interpretation. We can argue whether that's valid or not valid. The other thing also, like in the just to follow up on the just to be in the direction and not necessarily to be accurate. I just for example, I say gold, and I, I'm sure I'm not the first one who said this. In fact, so much in Bitcoin, we read and we listen to so many people. So I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm not, I'm always giving credit when I say something. Uh, and if I don't remember, I'm sure somebody else said it, but Bitcoin as a, as a monetary asset is far superior to me than gold. You know, it's, I can, for so many reasons, I mean, and, and it's more like 10 X better than gold. And so to me, I think that Bitcoin exchange rate, and I, hate, I hesitate even to say price, but Bitcoin exchange rate to the US dollar, I mean, until, reaches, until Bitcoin reaches the market cap, the valuation of gold, maybe even 10 times gold, I think of it as undervalued. So I don't know. I mean, I, I can't think of anything more bullish than that, even though I'm not being exact. I'm just, I, I just feel that that's the direction. And like you said, like you said earlier, I, I, I was listening, even, even gold may appreciate. So those, the, the valuation of gold is itself is a moving target. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable and extremely heavy. If I put it on the desk, I seriously fear for my own table. It's so, so heavy and durable. I love it. This is where my seed phrase is secure. Go to bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you use code Robin, you even get 5% off of your complete order. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to 
set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, that's why I like the, I bring it a lot up in, in the, the past episodes. I feel like uh, Jesse Meyer's model uh, around um, there's a total net assets in the world. And then it's just a question of how much of those total net assets will Bitcoin subsume. Uh, and then it doesn't come a question of what is the exact price, but what is the percentage of Bitcoin capturing from the total net uh, not ne total net net wealth uh, and then we can measure it in today's taller terms and then just add up inflation or that but inflation doesn't matter anyway so you can just like say like oh uh, if if bitcoin for example subsumes uh, around uh, 85 percent of and that's the most bullish case for me 85 percent of the total net wealth wealth then 0 0.1 Bitcoin will be 5 million US dollars in today's purchasing powers dollars terms. So that's an interesting model to think of. Like that's like if the most bullish case comes to uh, reality in Bitcoin with like around 85% of the total wealth being in Bitcoin, then we can kind of consume, okay, if you have 0 0.1 Bitcoin today, that might be when this case reaches at that time, 5 million US dollars right now. And that's an interesting model to think of. Uh, by the way, it's also like two Satoshis are then $1. Uh, so we're not even in that, like a lot of people are, uh, uh, talk about dollar and um, uh, bit comparity, but in yeah. that, in that uh, thing, it, it doesn't even happen in the most bullish case. It only happens if we have hyperinflation of the US dollar. But just from that perspective, I think, Bitcoin will not reach that parity unless the US dollar hype inflates, which is very likely. <laughs> uh, so pricing models are always interesting and, and different people come to different conclusions. But th the, the moment you put a time frame on that is really hard because my model with like this 85%, nobody can attack me because I don't put a time frame on it. I don't say like 2050 or 21 or 2060 or 2020. I don't know. Uh, eight or something like that um, because that's really hard to predict. I might be able to put up a model and say like, oh, there we probably go. But the time frame is really complicated to to put on on, on such a such a question. So I, I I love that you also as a as a give, gave us your insights as someone who studied math. Yeah, yeah, and Bitcoin. Remember, Bitcoin is going to give us the two separations that uh, Parker Lewis talks about, and I love it. Everyone says, you know, separate money from state, and that's wonderful. That's, that's the beginning, but Parker Lewis in his book, uh, Gradually Then Suddenly, I mean, uh, I mean, he also talks about the second separation, which is separate money from banks. And, and that sounds counterintuitive, but he explains it. And he says, you know, once you have, you know, instead of, the, he gives the diagram of in the center of the circle, there's the, the money printer in fiat. And then outside is the, you know, so that's the central bank. And then outside it, the ring outside it is the um, 
commercial, big commercial banks, and then it's the small regional banks. And basically, banks would still be there. They would still offer financial services. They would still give you advice, but they will be on equal footing with you competing for capital. They will not just get the capital automatically with no proof of work, with just a stroke of a keyboard from the central bank through the commercial bank, you know, I mean, and so they will be equal footing. So they will have to basically, they'll go, they almost, they'll go back to full reserve banking, which will be more sound, less bailouts. So some of these things we cannot predict. We know that they will add more value to society and, and, and more productivity. And so things will be cheaper. And so maybe we can survive on even less sats. And so, like you were saying, even a smaller number of sats will be a, a, a significant fortune because, because money will be more sound. That's very important. That's hard to predict. We cannot, it's very hard to predict human innovation. I love that the 8 billion people in the world and so many of them are smarter than me because that means my life is getting better when I'm on a Bitcoin standard. So, so Bitcoin eliminates, reduces my jealousy, reduces my um, anxiety, you know, makes me realize that anything good that happens in the world in a new invention in India and in China in Africa, anywhere in Europe, anywhere, it's going to benefit me. And I think that's why, like when Jack Mahler's, says, uh, I think even you say it, like uh, like uh, Larry Fink works for me. Everybody in Bitcoin works for me. And I, I do see it. I do see it because people will become more sovereign, more free. And that's hard to model in any, in, in any mathematical model. That's, that's a, a really great point that everyone is working for you. Like Michael Saylor is working for you. You are working for me. I work for you. And the, and the concept of that is extremely underrated i feel like because when you then come to a point where for example there's someone that reinvents cameras and all of a sudden cameras are way smaller way cheaper and everyone can have cameras because they just don't cost like i have now a youtube camera there i think it was around like 800 900 euros with the lens and everything uh so th that's quite expensive but if you then go and uh, there's someone is like oh i revolutionized how we make cameras and they are way better than the thousand euro cameras and it they just cost 100 euros that benefits him a lot but it also benefits everyone else because everyone else gets that cheaper uh, electronic and we get more productive uh, and that's that's an, um, that's something that we don't realize what bitcoin will do because right now we have so many different uh currencies we have so many different jurisdictions and central banks that when someone in the u.s does something really great this benefits the people in the u.s and not as many as the whole society but if everyone is on the same money standard it benefits everyone and that's something uh, truly amazing. And m maybe like people would ask like, okay, why is it benefiting everyone? Because the person is saving in Bitcoin because everyone is saving in Bitcoin. That's the major thing. What, what do you want to add? Exactly. No, no, exactly, exactly. And that's where we have to be very humble to realize that it's actually very difficult to make a financial model. So whoever comes up with a financial model, you know, give them a hug. I mean, it's not easy to to <laughs> to, to come up with one and to account for all these um, concepts and, and all these events that we can't really uh, factors that we cannot really sometimes think of. How has uh, Bitcoin uh, made change in, in, in your personal life, in your family life, in, in your um, financial life? What, what did Bitcoin change in you or... Uh, change for you? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm going to be honest, Robin, I'm going to tell you, like, you know, Bitcoin took many touch points for me. It wasn't like, I mean, and I, maybe I'm a little bit on the slow side, maybe it takes me longer, but but it took me about, you know, like, like almost like five years just from from the first time thinking about it, reading it, then buying it, and then selling it, because I thought it was just, you know, like a, like a, like a tech stock. And then, then, then I start, you know, okay, here, put a percentage of your net worth and then go all in and, and then minimize and try to go all in. But it, it takes, it takes longer, but I'm going to admit it's not always easy. And, and that's why we are, I, I'm not going to say we are like, like the original 
OGs of Bitcoin. We are not. They are amazing. They were there first, and I honor them. I love them. I respect what they've been through. But on a micro scale, honestly, Robin, we've also, I mean, people who are in Bitcoin for a year, people who are in Bitcoin for two years, really, even people who just got into Bitcoin a few months ago, like we are on a journey that is on a smaller scale, much like that journey of the of the OGs, of the originals of of of, of Bitcoin, because because not everybody will understand. I mean, we are here and we understand each other, but for the rest of the world, Robin, we are so early. My family thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> my family thinks I lost my mind. They think I'm going to burn myself, even though what I believe what they're that 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 I'm doing something that is even more conservative than more safe than you know i mean I, I like the reason honestly robin there is a lot of what i call i mean it's not my term i've heard this term and it stuck with me i honestly don't remember who said it maybe you can help me crypto confusion a lot I, of people go ahead i i think i never really heard it but so i don't know who, from whom it is maybe it maybe it's uh from from someone that It was already on my podcast, but I, I don't, I, I didn't, I never heard it actually, a, a crypto it's, confusion. It's basically the, the confusion, the confounding, the mixing of where, where they don't know the difference between Bitcoin and crypto or Bitcoin and gambling, Bitcoin and, you know, like degenerate behavior where addictive behavior where you go and you try to overcompensate for something missing in your life. So you... You, you know, we are, I mean, my family, I love my family. It's, they're, you know, they're coming around. They love me. They still think I'm crazy, <laughs> but, but I, I go back with love and I, I, I just give them time because, because in the end, everybody has their own time. I was able to bit to orange pill, um, a, a, a few of my friends, some of them, some, some in my family, but not everyone. I mean, not even, not even a. And, you know, like a very, very small minority that I was able to truly Bitcoin. But so it's, it's a, to, to orange pill, but it, it is a journey. And I'm saying it's not all roses and flowery journey. It is really a humbling journey. It's it could be there's a lot of introspection. You're looking at yourself. You're looking at your history. You're looking. It's almost like you become your own therapist. But but in the end, it's it's really worth it. It's really, really worth it. And. And I think time will prove me right. And I haven't done anything that I would regret. I still love my family. I'm still, but, but, and, and I think even when they are worried for me, <laughs> Robin, I think it's coming from love. They love me, you know, they, they love me. So it's coming from, from worried, from them worried again, because they have crypto confusion. They think, oh, Bitcoin, that must be, um, I don't know, FTX or, you know, it's the same Thing. So you just have to slowly with love, you know, in, in, um, in psychology, there's uh, the famous psychologist Piaget, and he has the constructivist model of learning, of teaching. It's basically like, you know, it's not direct instruction. I don't just come in and say, I'm the teacher and this is how we do it. One, two, three. That's direct instruction. Sometimes that's okay, but it's not for always. Um, there's another method where, you know, it's discovery. I just give you an open-ended prompt and here's the problem. I'm the teacher and you're the student. And then you try to just kind of, you know, like a journey, like a discovery education. Those are the two extremes. But Piaget says, well, there's something in the middle where you, it's constructivist approach. You see where everybody is and you see it's in the middle. It's not direct instruction and it's not open discovery. It's basically in the middle. You see where somebody is at and you look at their house of knowledge, almost like a house, brick by brick in their mind. And then you try to give them just that one brick that you think will fit into their house of knowledge. And you have to give them that brick in a nice way, in a nice manner, in a nice something that is validating to them, that helps them. And then they have to collect that brick and literally put it, I mean, not really literally, figuratively, and put it in their house of knowledge. And so, so a lot of times if you are with your family and I mean, not you, but like if anyone else is listening is with their family and they're struggling to realize it's normal, it's going to take time. And eventually we will be, I'm not going to say proven right. I mean, but it gets better with time and 
people just have to be on their journey to 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 get there they will catch up to you it's just never say anything that you will regret always spread love and i think that's really hard i think uh you're 100 uh, right and uh not coming back to what Michael Saylor actually said in my interview again, spread Bitcoin with love and not with hate, like uh, be, being respectful and uh, being someone that spreads it always with love and not like hatred. So that's really, 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 really important. Um, but I get what a lot of people also in the comments and when I talk with them say when they're like, oh, but it's so frustrating that <laughs> people don't get it. They they have in their minds, like oh, I told him about Bitcoin when it was uh, 5,000. I told him when it was about 20,000. Now it's it dips <laughs> to 50,000. And I told him again. Uh, and and it's like it already 10x from where I told the first guy to. Like, that, like or, or people say like, oh, it already 20x since I told you about it. When will you learn? So... Some maybe have this moment in their head, like when they finally come to like, oh, I get it now. Sorry. That, like, I, I think that's actually something where, where Bitcoiners struggle with, uh, where they are the, the only one in their family that really get Bitcoin. And then they, they want to prove everyone uh, uh, right. They want, oh, they want to prove everyone wrong. They're like, hey, Bitcoin is this thing. And the price thing becomes that that one measurement where they can prove them wrong or they say like, oh, there's this one billionaire uh, that is now in Bitcoin and send them the videos, like th those kind of things. Um, and how I de dealt with that, uh, maybe uh, if, maybe it's interesting for, for people to know how, how, how we deal with that or how I dealt with that. I went full on in the internet world and searched for people that got it. So I can let my talking power of Bitcoin onto people that actually care about that and the people that i care about in my personal life i don't bother them with my bitcoin talk <laughs> so so that was really that was therapeutic for me that was really good to find real people on the internet that i can talk to in bitcoin <laughs> so that was kind of the start to where i'm right now because now honestly um i don't talk about bitcoin with my girlfriend almost ever like we talk about it maybe every third or fourth day uh, oh bitcoin is that and she's also the the girlfriend of a bitcoiner in her work so like work colleagues of hers even though i was never in the workplace come to her and say like oh what's bitcoin doing and she's like i actually don't know like i just have a bitcoin as a, as a boyfriend uh, so um i i like the position that i'm right now and i can talk with so many people about bitcoin uh, and my Bitcoin talking power is 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 there somewhere. But at the same time, I don't have to bother my family with it. But every once in a while, someone from my family comes here and says like, hey, Robin, you, you make Bitcoin content. How's that about Bitcoin? Or, or how does this work? Or where do I buy it? Or, uh, or I heard that thing, what's bad for Bitcoin? Is that true? Like, I love that. Because I don't tell them to buy Bitcoin. I just... Um, I see myself like as a math teacher. I see myself as a teacher that has just like some some subject. It, it, it could be math, it could be history, it, it could be anything. I, with Bitcoin, there are all, all those subjects in there anyways. Uh, so they come to me and I don't try to like, oh yeah, Bitcoin is the thing you should get into it. No, like uh, they ask me the question like, oh, how is that, uh, how will, uh, how, how does Bitcoin make sure that transactions are safe? Then I explain them how transactions are safe and how transactions are uh, working in Bitcoin. So I switched completely in my head from making people understand Bitcoin to teaching them about their question that they have about Bitcoin. Because they yeah. see it so many times in the news, they will come anyways to me. They, they, they will see it someday and they're like, oh yeah, Bitcoin, uh, Robin was the guy for that. Let's call him. Yeah, it's exactly. And it's because they are building, it's, it goes back to that Piaget constructivist theory of learning is that they are looking at their house of knowledge brick by brick and they're saying oh there's a loose brick here there's a missing brick and so then they come to ask you and this is the perfect moment where you 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 explain to them that brick and that's where they're most receptive because they came to you with a question 
and then they you fix that one brick for them they put it back and now their house is a little bit stronger and they will um, ask you so as long as so I guess the key is just make yourself available and open to questions and honestly that's the best you can do that's uh, absolutely true like um, I would say like for and then I would so, so, tell, told them this everyone like if you want to orange pill your family make sure everyone knows that you are a bitcoiner and then just wait <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. they, they will have questions uh, and they care about you. Your family loves you, even though sometimes it doesn't, uh, maybe it doesn't uh, seem like that, but all, all the people love you and you love your family. So that's, that's something uh, I have a, th that's one big lesson that I have from orange billing people. One thing uh, before we come to the end routine uh, that I have uh, one question before the end routine I have for you, what is, the most important lesson that you got from Bitcoin? The most important lesson I got, honestly, Robin, from Bitcoin is Bitcoin is like a, like a, like a lens, like, like a binoculars, like a, like glasses and it, or a filter and Bitcoin as a lens, it allows you, it's almost like a, like a, like a psychological superpower or a psychological tool that allows you to really um, look at everything with like more basic first principles. It allows you to look back at your own life and like, why did I buy a house when I, when I first got my first job? Why, why did I want to buy the biggest house possible and take the biggest mortgage possible? Why, why did, why were we told that, you know, in the, in the 2000s era where interest rate was so low? Why did my, why did my parents do what they did? Why did they migrate from one place to the other Why did, why did my ancestry do something? So Bitcoin allows you to think and be gentle and, and realize, be kind, because they didn't have perfect money. I mean, and, and so they did the best that they could, you know, whether they saved in real estate or they saved in stocks or they saved. So everybody, is, everybody did the best that they could because money wasn't perfect. So Bitcoin allows you to really be nicer, gentler, and more understanding of what people did, what, why they did it, and how they were trying to get better. So that's, that's definitely something that Bitcoin has allowed me to do. Because, you know, like fiat centralizes everything. Fiat, like banks start becoming bigger and bigger and centralized, food companies bigger and bigger, oil companies bigger and bigger, because it all has to do with who's closer to the money printer. So fiat farms, same thing, supermarkets, grocery, like, so, so, so there is a distortion in the market with fiat. So you need, you need to look at it from a sound money principle. And then it, it makes the world, even world history makes more sense. You know, I mean, just to, to, to tell you, like, for example, I love the TV show Vikings. I, I'm obsessed with, I love Vikings. Uh, I also like, for example, Game of Thrones, such fantasy. But like Vikings, to me, was was a lesson in when when the, when the in the golden age of the Vikings and they go to England and they raid, and then the English king says, "Oh well, how many gold coins can I give you to leave and don't come back?" And you start seeing how how when gold was, and how armies they would just like line up and see how much gold every every king has and then they decide to you know what we're not going to just uh, fight because maybe it, it's it's losing for both of us um or, or or little things there's there's one scene sorry i can i take 30 seconds just to expand on this we, we have enough time okay. <laughs> there's one scene in vikings i don't want to give it away it's a small scene it's not a spoiler but there's there's the there's the brother you know rollo rollo is the is the brother of um, ragnar lothbrook He's the main character in Vikings. And, and Rolo is jealous of his brother. Rolo is jealous because he thinks the gods chose Ragnar over him and the people chose Ragnar over him. And he's a great warrior. He's the bear. And Ragnar, you know, is more... It's a beautiful series. It's a beautiful... Uh, it's made by, I think, by the History Channel, Vikings. Um, and it's beautiful. And so he goes to the seer, you know, Robin, like the oracle, like the, the blind fortune teller. And he cries and he says, 
you know, like the gods have forsaken me. I have no reason to live. Even even Lagatha, he, she's the wife of Ragnar. He he kind of is jealous because he also loves her. And he says, like, my life is not worth living. What am I? I'm struggling. But he has a good heart. He's a he's a strong warrior. He's loyal to his brother. He's everything. And then the and then the seer tells him, um, he starts the seer starts laughing and says, If you knew what the gods have in store for you, you will go dancing naked on the beach right now. And because because what happens, it's based on true historic events, is Rollo actually has a better ending. Uh, he becomes the king of Normandy, like the king of France gives him uh, a, a noble woman to marry. He becomes the Viking king of Normandy. But little things like that, like when you understand Bitcoin, honestly, you start enjoying historical uh, dramas and historical works of uh, history and even fiction because because you start seeing um, our, our human, the story of us, the human, uh, the, this human story through the ages. And it's a really beautiful um, thing where fiat is just, foggy fiat is foggy and bitcoin is clarity and it's, and i cannot emphasize that uh, enough and and i I'm not to go on a tangent but even banks even banks you know i'm i'm not here i'm not far from new york new york city like even the the commercial banks robin they are now like like we think of it as bitcoin on one side and central bank on the other side or bitcoin sound money versus fiat but but Robin, the commercials banks, the commercial banks, they will one day realize that they have been with fiat because they have a lending license. So they can just get money for free from the central bank and they can lend and make money based on loans that they make. They make a cash flow based on that. But now they are going to realize that for them to exist, fiat is going to betray them. The, I mean, the, the central bank is going to betray them. If they do CBDC, central bank digital currency, well, why do you need a central? Why do you need a, a commercial bank then? The central bank, one node, can just put money in people's phones, and so even commercial banks are realizing that. Oh no, maybe we need to be on the side of Bitcoin. Maybe we need to try to custody Bitcoin, try to sell Bitcoin, try to give financial services, and so it's going to change everything. I just go back. the The whole theme of what I'm saying is, fiat is fog, and it will change and it's foggy and it's confusing, but Bitcoin has more clarity and it will change alliances even in our lifetime of things we didn't, we cannot even imagine. That's a beautiful, beautiful uh, explanation. Really cool. Thank you so much, Cho, for, for, for that. I think that's a, a wonderful way to say it. And, and even like, I love the CBDC so much because I think CBDCs will be the best marketing tool for Bitcoin. Everyone will be like, oh, that's that's really bad that they can uh, uh, ban that and do that and uh, do all those things with, with, with fiat because it's just like fiat, but worse than that. <laughs> and people will realize, people are not stupid. They will realize that. So I really hope and, and think that CBDCs will be a great marketing tool uh, yeah. for for Bitcoin, the, the revolution now. Really cool. Yeah, and it, it will make banks, the commercial banks who we thought were on the side of fiat, it will make them come to the side of Bitcoin, which is it yes. blows my mind when I think about that. Yeah, it's uh, have next uh, week even a, uh, interview with, with someone that uh, from a bank, he works in a bank and he's now orange billing German banks and banks uh, uh, and because uh, he's saying like, oh, CBDCs basically delete the commercial banks. And he's like, if commercial banks now go on to a Bitcoin standard, they might have a chance to actually live on a little bit longer or to actually make business model around Bitcoin because they might not be needed in like five, 10 years when CBDCs are around. So uh, it would have been an interesting conversation with him because I think you're very true with CBDCs. Why, why would, if, if, if I have a direct bank account with the uh, central bank in Europe, why do I need my local bank? Uh, there's no need for that. I can get a loan from the, the, the ECP directly. So uh, even though I really hate that thought, but... <laughs> It's, it's then it's it's possible and it's it's really interesting yeah so so much uh thank you um we come now to end routine where we have uh one question is always the same for everyone what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about wow uh, just bitcoin it's good to be humble bitcoin it's good to be humble and bitcoin definitely will make you humble 
look, I mean, I'm, I'm learning so much from people that are half my age. And I am so happy and grateful to be to be uh, learning from like you and uh, your podcast. I really respect your work ethic and how many you interview. I, I really, truly, I mean, I know I, I don't think I'm even the first person to say this, but I really think that you um, will one day become something what like how we think of Joe Rogan or I don't know who else is bigger, Tucker Carlson or... Lex Friedman or like all these podcasters, because I really think that uh, like you will be rewarded for your hard work. So so what you can learn from me is number one, humility and be humble, be open and always stay on top of puzzles and tricks and like math puzzles and uh, recreational, what we call recreational math. You know, like like uh, you're never just because, oh, I'm done with school. I don't want to do math. No, read for fun. Do puzzles for fun. You know, I teach all my students how to solve Rubik's Cubes and puzzles. And, and, and it's really important to keep your mind active and enjoy everything like a puzzle. You know, like Erno Rubik's, the founder, the, the creator of Rubik's Cube, he says, all our life is solving puzzles. And really it is. All our life, treat everything like a puzzle. Um, uh, and, and that's very, very useful. It doesn't matter. Age is just a number. You will learn so much from younger people if you humble yourself. And the first, one of the first things about Bitcoin is you get to Bitcoin when you realize that you were wrong about Bitcoin and you're humble enough and you have overcome your ego. And many good things will happen to you when you are humble. Thank you so much. That, uh, that means a lot for me, the, the compliment. Uh, Joe, Joe Rogan is... Uh, I think the, the grandmaster of, of podcasting, <laughs> 15 years, he's already doing it, uh, three or four podcasts in, in, on average, like 3.4, something like that. There's like thousands of, of podcast guests with like, he does like longer podcasts than me. So like he has calculate 15 years times 3.4 uh, podcasts a week times three, four, five hours with each guest. That's a lot of knowledge in his head in, in, for, just from the podcast, having them, um, that that's massive. So, um, I'm, I'm working to get to that level. And that's why I commit committed to a daily Bitcoin podcast for the next 10 years. There might be m maybe the topic changes, like maybe Bitcoin comes along the way boring because it's already the world reserve currency along the way. I don't think so, but maybe the adoption goes faster than, uh, than, than that. But the next 10 years, I will be podcasting no matter what. I will be making a podcast every single day uh, and I will make that that happen. And I committed myself to do that. And um, I, it feels so great to to know what you will do. Like that's the n number one thing that I will do. And from there, then you can distill all the other things and, and think your way and, and find your way to the different things of like, oh, you have a guest speaking engagement here, or you meet that person. Maybe you have a, a small business there. So like th there are things that happen maybe around the podcast, but the podcast is the one big thing that I want to continue. Uh, so like everyone that is listening and watching this here, they, they can rely on me making this podcast for the next 10 years uh if if i'm physically and mentally uh capable of doing that and i will make sure i am the next 10 years uh, capable to do that so i'm really looking forward to the next 10 years and it means a lot that uh, that you see that that my commitment is so high and that you see that the proof of work that uh, goes into that small baby of mine that i yeah. have no, it, it does really, Robin. It adds value because, you know, a lot of people are listening uh, and, 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 and benefiting because you learn. I know we were sometimes it sounds repetitive what we are saying, but it really is. It's important. I don't think we we think we are. Um, we think everyone knows Bitcoin when you when we are talking only to each other. But honestly, Robin, we are so early. People outside have no idea what Bitcoin is. It's so interesting. Like it's it's so so interesting. You know that my two friends, my my uh, recently I joined I I I, uh, I orange pilled and I was so I was even when I thought they got it. I mean they were still asking questions. That for sure this is you know like we are early. We are early and and um, and it's really important to just have a good life and have a Try to live a simple life where you are making more money than you are spending. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You're accumulating more um, sats. And, and, and just 
live and time will is on our side. It's almost like a game theory in a game of chess or where you almost like you see the advantage, but you still have to play a few moves and and eventually you know that the checkmate is coming and you're going to checkmate your opponent. So it's it, it, we are in a situation like this. You know, we just have to not fumble. We just have to not screw up. We have to make sure that, you know, safety and security of our setup, of our Bitcoin, and always make a new goal for yourself. Like for 2024, you know, not just the stacking goal, but I, I want to run a node. I want to start maybe mining next year. I want to learn more about that. Uh, as something like a small desktop miner, and I'm looking already into it. But always make a goal like that that will make you more secure and make make sure that I have somebody who I can trust who will pass this along to my daughter because she's my whole life. And, and my wife and I, I mean, it's really important. It's, it's always build your own citadel, build your own um, sovereign existence and make sure that you have a plan to pass it along. Because my goal is not to spend the Bitcoin and go crazy when I'm old. I mean, no, my goal is to pass it along to my daughter. I, I hope I die with more Bitcoin than I have today so that I can pass it along safely. That's very important to me. I love that a lot. Really cool. Thank you for, for those kind words and thank you for those. Uh, I think it's, it can be inspiring for, for some people that are listening and watching. Thank you so much. Um, we have the end routine where the previous mm -hmm. guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, your question from the previous guest is opening up a whole new topic. Do you think homeschooling will be the future of kids' education? Wow. That is, <laughs> that's a very, very, very uh, close to heart, this question. I, I'm I'm going to tell you, the, the, the short answer is yes. I think the short answer is yes. When you look at old historical dramas and, you know, like you would have the king's son or the queen's son and they would have a tutor. And it would be a tutor for fencing and a tutor for reading and a tutor for philosophy. Um, I think I think that was very valuable. I think also... I have a theory that the ideal classroom size, and I know I, I don't have any proof for it or like scientific evidence or studies, but I believe that the ideal classroom size is 12. And it even has to do maybe where Jesus had 12 disciples. Maybe it has to do mathematically that uh, 12 is a highly composite number. You can split the class, you can split the students into groups of two, groups of three, groups of four, groups of six, 12 is a very composite number. You know, it's not a prime number, it's highly composite. So 12 is an ideal number. A lot of classrooms right now, you know, you have much larger um, class size. I think homeschooling is beautiful. I think homeschooling is wonderful. And, and honestly, a lot of I, I, one of my favorite books, you know, is um, Jimmy Song, Fiat Ruins Everything. And there's a whole, I mean, he talks about education. And it really is, honestly, Robin, education was better before the government got involved. In only, even in the U.S., before we had the National Federal Department of Education, student standardized test scores were better. Fiat, I'm not going to say ruined education, but Fiat has not been good to education and public schools, or I should say, I should call them government schools. And I really, really think that we're going to have a golden age ahead of us of tutoring, of math education, of philosophy, of classical education. And homeschooling is going to be uh, a very, very, very valuable thing because Because even having two parents have to work and go on the rat race and barely survive, that is a fiat concept. And on Bitcoin, it will be a little bit more like the old days when you hear stories of, you know, my grandfather had one salary, he was a janitor, and he was able to put four kids in college and buy a house with a fence, and mom stayed home, and, 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 and money was more sound before the... The, the the money printing so so yes to the answer to the question yes there is nothing more valuable i mean i have one daughter the the, the love of my life i have one daughter she, she's my whole life and i i was very privileged to spend so much time with her 
Um, I mean, she did go to school, but I was also very involved with her. So it's almost like she, like for my daughter, I, it's almost like she went to school and got homeschooled by me. So it was, it was very, very um, special. And, and Bitcoin will enable this. And not only that, I mean, that's just one thing, education. But take that to healthcare, take that to travel, take that to housing. A lot of these things a lot of these categories that are now, they seem so hard for so many people to make headway. We will have a golden age with, with Bitcoin and um, daycares. Uh, I mean, everything will be re, 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 rethought, remodeled, re, re, re-envisioned in a Bitcoin, on a Bitcoin standard. It's, it's a, what a oh, beautiful question. Like really, it's, I'm getting emotional just even thinking about it, how, how nice it is to be homeschooling. So lovely. Really, really cool. Uh, thank you so much, Joe. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask questions, reach out to you? Yeah, no, it's, um, I'm, I'm on X. It's just Joe Kazemi, um, at Joe Kazemi. I have, my website is Dr. K math, seven, seven, seven com. So just Dr. D R K math, seven, seven, seven. It's really, it's really, um, um, I, I mean, I, I talk about Bitcoin. I'm public about it. I think it's important for us to be public uh, as long as we feel that we are secure in our in, in our Bitcoin setup. I think it's important for us to be to be public and to and I think we think by talking. So it's important for us to talk, even if I make a mistake talking. That was me thinking. That's why freedom of speech is so important, you know. It's a, uh, it's, it's, and I, I salute you for keeping it up and just allowing us, allowing us to talk. So yeah, at X, uh, Joe Kazemi and my own website, Dr. K Math 7. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I will uh, leave as always uh, the, the X uh, uh, content linked uh, down below. And I think from your X profile, you, they can also find your website. So everything is in the, in the description uh, for you uh, that is watching and listening. Thank you yeah. so much. One more thing. Yeah, okay, so 30 seconds. This time I really promise 30 seconds. I'll show you some trick how beautiful math is. Okay, Robin, literally 30 seconds. Give me a number from one to nine, your favorite digit, one to nine. Uh, seven. Seven. Okay. So, Robin, I'm going to put seven in the calculator, okay? Robin, again, 30 seconds. I'm going to multiply it times nine. And, Robin, what should we expect to have? You know? 63, yes. Okay, the iPhone works. Okay. Now, Robin, watch. I'm going to multiply this. This is the product. I'm going to multiply it by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Skip eight. I'm skipping eight and then multiplying time nine. Okay? I skipped eight. Robin, what was your original number? Seven. Okay. Now, Robin, this is a very simple, very simple math trick. It's not even a trick. It's really multiplying three numbers. I just changed the order. But it just shows you how beautiful math is. And when you when you are working with, when math and education is fun, philosophy is fun, and, and goes back to what you were saying about, you know, homeschooling and working with a tutor with a small connection in a small classroom size, it's Bitcoin will give us that golden age again. I, I love it so much. Thank you for sharing that for me. Like I, I will, I will, I will, I will dabble with that trick again afterwards. <laughs> really, really cool. Uh, I think that that's one trick that I think I heard it like like ten years ago. It's it's in the back of my mind. I, I heard that trick already, uh, but it's it's really a cool one. I love that a lot. Yeah, it's it's an elementary. It's like elementary school. It's not like uh, high school even or middle school. It's like you know, it's elementary school math. But it's a, it's a very beautiful trick, and it works with every number. And you always skip eight. And there's a reason. And when you explain it, the students start say, "Oh wow, I see it!" And it's it's so much fun. <laughs> Really cool. Thank you so much, Joe, for, for being on the show. Uh, and thank you also so much for, for everyone that is watching and listening, uh, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.